Okay, what is up, guys? My name is Drew Rice, and welcome to the Wealth for 99 podcast, episode four. Today, I'm going to be talking about different uh, five different topics. There's going to be the first is going to be on gig workers and Proposition 22 in California. The second is going to be three minimum wage myths that are very common. Uh, third will be California Proposition 15. Fifth and fourth and fifth will be the stock market is not the economy and why that is. And then lastly, I'll be going over why everyone needs a Roth IRA, in my opinion. So in just a moment, I'm going to get started with Prop 22. And today's episode is going to be a bit heavy on, um, you know, legislation that's going to be affecting Californians specifically, which is where I live. However, I think that the um, insight that people can gain from them are going to be valuable for people throughout the United States since Generally speaking, California tends to uh, set the bar um, when it comes to legislation across the United States and uh, regulations. So in just a moment, I will get started with uh, Prop 22 and what it means for the average person in California. Uh, at any time during this live stream, if you have any questions, uh, put those in the live chat and I will get to those in between topics. But I will be covering one topic at a time and uh, answer all those. So just please be patient with me. Thank you. Okay, so our first topic today is going to be on Prop 22, California Prop 22, and what it means for gig workers and uh, how that may affect people across the United States outside of California if this becomes a trend. So for the basic background on it that you'll need to understand is that in September of 2019, California passed Assembly Bill 5. This is known as the, uh, colloquially, as the gig worker bill. And basically what it did was it extended the uh, employee classification to gig workers. So this is like, you know, rideshare, uh, like Uber, Lyft, Postmates, Instacart, Grubhub, these types of companies. And what it essentially was trying to do was get rid of what a lot of legislators view as a loophole that these gig companies are using by calling their employees independent contractors in order to not have the same requirements as far as benefits, health care, and other things like of that nature. Um, for Assembly Bill 5, once it passed, it created a three-pronged test for independent contractor claims. So a company would have to fulfill all three of these in order to be able to, you know, legally claim that they had independent contractor as opposed to an employee. And those three things are that the worker is free to perform services without the control or direction of the company, which these companies are able to satisfy because, you know, Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, they pick their own hours. They're able to choose when they want to work and they are not told what to do directly by the company. Rule number two is one that ends up being a problem that they are trying to deal with. And that is that the worker is performing work tasks that are outside the usual course of the company's business activities. So what this means is that when you have a company like Uber, where its primary business activity is, you know, transportation of people, uh, that means that if a worker is transporting people, then they are performing normal tasks, not tasks outside the usual course of business. This is the issue that these gig companies are having. And a good example of what would be considered an independent contractor under California under this Assembly Bill 5 uh, would be, say, you are a person who, say, you own a business and you need to paint the outside of that business. If you hire a painter to come and paint the outside of that business, but you are, say, a bakery, then that painting would be outside your normal business activities, and you could consider that person an independent contractor, according to Assembly Bill 5. And number two is the one that they have the issue with. Uh, and number three, the third uh, prong part of the test that you need to satisfy is that the worker is customarily engaged in an independently established trade, occupation, or business of the same nature as that involved in the work performed. So this is, you know, one that they're able to satisfy um, because it's independent of the uh, rest of the company. This is not... Um, 
you know, a issue they're having. It's number two is the primary one. And so the conflict ends up being that the ride shares have, you know, a difficulty um, with requirement two, and they're actively fighting this measure um, of Assembly Bill 5 with Proposition 22. And that's going to be on the ballot in November. Um, and on top of that, they've been threatening to, you know, leave California if they end up not um, prevailing because California has let them know that they are currently not, you know, acting within the law according to Assembly Bill 5. So what this means for you if you're, an, if you're a voter in the state of California is um, you either vote yes or no on different on propositions generally, and a yes vote would support uh, defining rideshare workers as independent contractors, and it would not subject the rideshare companies and employees to Assembly Bill 5, and essentially what this would do is it ends up limiting the benefits that those workers would get if they were considered employees. Um, and then a no vote, which is your other option, would be to oppose this bill, and that would mean that California Assembly Bill 5, which requires the three-pronged test for proving independent contractor and not an employee, it would make that Assembly Bill 5 still valid for app-based drivers. And the logic behind this is that... Um, you know, they would give them the protections that an employee gets versus those uh, that are lesser of an independent contractor. So let's look at the why. Um, so categorizing workers as independent contractors means that they are uh, exempt from a lot of different protections like minimum wage laws, overtime laws, unemployment insurance, health care subsidies, paid sick leave, vehicle accident insurance, mileage rates, all of these things that Oh, most other employees are able to benefit from and inside the state of California are required to benefit from. Um, when we're looking at each of those, I mean, I think everyone is well aware of what minimum wage and overtime is. Uh, unemployment insurance is, you know, the uh, unemployment benefits that the government pays out to unemployed workers. Those are paid by companies. Um, and so if companies are getting out of that, then essentially they are not providing to the unemployment insurance within that state. So that's another reason that California is looking at this as a problem is because they see these rideshare companies as skirting their public responsibility of paying into the system. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's a pretty big deal. And then also one thing that people don't consider is, say, like me working in a, uh, you know, an engineering job. If I have to drive somewhere that's outside of the normal, um, you know, business, like to and from work, if I have to go on a trip, then you know, I would get a mileage rate of however many cents per mile, depending on, you know, your company and whatever contracts you're under. Um, this is something that they don't get. And it's a really big expense. If you've ever looked into driving for one of these rideshare companies, um, is the wear and tear uh, and depreciation on your car for how much you're driving it. Um, also, this uh, would, allowing them to be called independent contractors, would um, end up removing, you know, not having to worry about protections for shift lengths and breaks. Uh, specifically, um, employees in the state of California can only have shift lengths of uh, 12 hours within a 24-hour period. Um, and then also employee uh, consideration will get, you know, requires access to disability insurance and accidental death insurance, both of which are pretty big, um, you know, perks of having a W-2 in job as <clears throat> and uh, so those are the pros for workers. Uh, this will also increase uh, California revenue, um, you know, which will help the state budget. Time out if it, is, it does not pass. Uh, Assembly Bill 5 will help the budget um, because of the increased revenue from the rideshare companies paying, um, you know, their share of taxes um, that they have not been um, for the past several years. Um, the possible cons for workers of um, you know, not uh, passing this is that companies like Uber and Lyft um, have threatened to leave and then, you know, try because they basically said that they can't comply with the standards that are going to be set or that are set rather under Assembly Bill 5 and that without Prop 22 passing, um, they will have to leave the state and then, you know, come back at some point in the future. But come back with less jobs because of the added costs to, um, you know, meet these standards. And um, also they suggest, the companies suggest that they would have to be stricter with their hours and be less flexible for drivers, which 
uh, many argue would you know remove the incentive for driving for those companies in the first place. Um, as many of those drivers, you know, one of the main draws is the flexibility. Um, now, I think it's really important to remember to like recognize when you look historically that you know this pitting um, of workers' rights by companies against everyone else, like consumers and the government. Um, you know, these types of threats of going away or increasing prices is a very old argument that companies use to fight minimum wage and other labor protections. And I'll go over, um, you know, minimum wage in the next segment. But, um, you know, California also has the highest admission standards, uh, and we still have, we still sell more cars than anywhere else in the United States. Um, it's, it's, it's an old trick. Uh, and generally speaking, it hasn't carried much weight. Um, so just something to keep in mind, but that is the rhetoric that these rideshare companies are putting out. Uh, and specifically these rideshare companies are putting out this rhetoric, um, you know, are Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Instacart, Postmates. They are all putting this out. Um, and that's, that's an important thing to remember because it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of lobbying going into this and specifically you have um, those, you know, just those five companies have, they funded the initiative and they've spent over $180 million in, um, you know, trying to promote this. And that makes this the most expensive ballot measure in California ever. Um, so they, ha they have a lot of reasons to, um, you know, to fight for this. These companies do. And so I think that's really important to remember. Um, also, I think personally again see this as kind of a bluff of them you know threatening to move if this proposition does not pass because when you look california is too valuable of a market share for this to be a credible threat in my opinion um california is the biggest economy in the united states uh we have almost double the size of our, our economy is almost double the size of number two and three which are texas and new york um at about like 2.8 trillion um, uh, you know, GDP, and uh, whereas those are about 1.7. So, I mean, we're not, I, I don't, I don't see that happening. And historically in the U S California has, you know, continued, has always kind of led the way in health and safety standards. And so I think this is something that even if you don't live in the state of California, that you're going to probably have to get used to, um, at least this type of legislation probably coming up in your state assemblies, because, it's, you know, it's coming. Uh, and California is probably going to be setting a precedent with this, assuming that it, you know, is, does not pass, but we will see. Um, I think it's fairly obvious from, you know, the, uh, you know, what I've been saying that my personal opinion on this is that I will be definitely voting no on Proposition 22. You'll definitely have to read through it. And I'll have, I have those links in the description below to the bill itself to Assembly 5 bill um and to a simple breakdown because the verbiage can be kind of confusing so that way you can read it for yourself but um in my personal opinion i i think that i'll be voting no and the reason is because companies that can't succeed while following the same rules as everyone else just aren't good enough to compete in my personal opinion i think that it's very important that we you know put workers first and protect their rights um and realize that capitalism only works when there are regulations in place to make it a competitive market. Um, when you have companies like Uber and Lyft that are propped up by venture capital that are not profitable um, and are undercutting you know, workers, essentially, I think that that's a really bad thing for the economy. And I think that it's something we should... Um, you know, be very wary of when it comes to embracing these new, um, you know, forward thinking tech companies. Um, and my opinion again is like similar to the state of California is that I think they've been cheating through misclassification of workers for years. Um, there's, you know, these, I, I know from myself, I thought about looking into, you know, Uber and Lyft as like a secondary, um, side income. And when you look at the costs associated with the, you know, gas mileage depreciation, and you add that together, it just makes no sense. Like, you're not making enough to cover um, that 
plus the amount you're making when you cover those um, aspects isn't making you more than I would at just going and working at a, you know, a fast food job that had decent benefits. Um, so in my opinion, I think they definitely need to have, you know, some reworking around this. So that's why I definitely don't want to, uh, you know, vote for this to pass. And also I will have, I have it in the description box is a link, uh, pointing out how, um, these companies have also been bailed out by the United States taxpayers. So I don't really feel sorry for them, uh, you know, in trying to fund this type of a bill, um, you know, either, either be able to compete playing by the same rules as everyone else or don't. That's my opinion on that. So that's why I'll be voting no on Prop 22. And now we're going to go back to the chat and see what is going on. Awesome. Thank you, Nikki. Yes, I am a nerd. I appreciate that. Glad to have you here. Um, yeah, appreciate it. And uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, during in between each topic, I will be checking the live chat. So if you have any questions or comments or, you know, whatever, uh, it can be economic finance, it can be, you know, anything related, uh, just put that in there and I will get back to it in between each segment. So if it takes me a minute, just be patient. I will get to you. I promise. Um, thank you for watching. And in a minute, I will get started on the next topic, which is going to be on some common minimum wage myths. So Awesome. So the next topic I'm going to be talking about are three minimum wage myths that are very pervasive um, in society. And I think it's really important for us to pressure test these and see the validity because they are very common in political discourse in the United States. Um, so first of all, what is minimum wage? Uh, I'm sure everyone is aware of and has heard of minimum wage, but I think it's important to look at what established minimum wage and what the goals of it were initially in order to evaluate what the goals of it should be today. So minimum wage was instituted in the United States in the uh, Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, which I'll be referring to as the FLSA um, for the rest of this. And basically the goal was to establish a floor on wages and create fair labor standards nationwide because there was a big discrepancy between certain areas of the country that, you know, were, you know, either more industrial or more agricultural, but because of those different economic, uh, you know, incentives and areas, there was a very lopsided, um, you know, wages in the United States. So this was trying to fix that problem. And the three main things that it did were that it mandated a living wage, um, it mandated overtime requirements, and that's specifically time and a half. Um, if you've worked a hourly job before, then you're aware of this. And that's for any time you work over 40 hours, you would get, you know, you get paid time and a half. And I know from when I worked hourly jobs, that was one of the best parts of working, uh, working long hours and volunteering for extra shifts was getting that sweet overtime. So I'm a pretty big fan of that. And then number three was that it added additional child labor regulations, um, specifically setting standards for like when uh, children, like how young children would be able to start working, uh, moving that standard up because of, you know, uh, companies taking advantage of young children and because they could pay them less was essentially the reason <clears throat> when I say taking advantage. Um, and so the purpose was, you know, to prevent companies from exploiting desperate workers. That's the idea because, you know, the argument is that there's, you know, there's always people that are willing to work for less and, you know, if we allow that, then you're going to essentially be constantly trying to get, you know, offer a company is going to be offering less and less because they're going to want to lower their overhead and their cost of doing business. And, um, you know, in a, in a country like the United States where we have enough resources, it doesn't really make sense to, uh, you know, exacerbate that problem. And so that was kind of the goal. Um, so the first lie that you hear about minimum wage is 
that it's not meant to be a living wage. Now, I know that I just said a minute ago that number one was that it mandated a living wage, but let me be more specific. So when you read the FLSA, which is linked below, uh, we can like you can see on its face that this claim has no weight. This is something that's been rhetorically used um, for the last you know at least several decades, um, and it just it doesn't hold up to scrutiny because when you read in the FLSA, it literally says like in quotes you know that a minimum standard of living necessary for health efficiency and the general well-being of workers. So not only is it a living wage, but it's a living wage that satisfies the, you know, health efficiency and well-being of those workers. So not just sustenance, but to a point where they are, you know, capable of living a generally fruitful life. Um, and that I think is a really important thing to keep in mind. Um, when we are when we hear these types of arguments line number two is that the minimum wage increases unemployment so this is a really um on its face like if you've taken macro or micro you know or fundamentals of econ you've definitely seen you know supply and demand curves and you know according to classic uh economic theory you know it would suggest that a you know adding in a price floor i.e minimum wage um, because that's the that's a floor on the price that you're able to offer an employee. Um, it would suggest that this would increase unemployment. However, when we look at it in the real world, and we've looked at you know meta studies, this isn't you know it hasn't been shown to be true. There are several meta studies that I'll have linked in the description uh, that show that there is no discernible effect on unemployment from minimum wage increases, and there's several different ideas behind this. Um, a couple of the reasons for why this would be the case are that economic models may need to change assumptions. So we got to keep in mind that anytime you build a mathematical, economic, you know, any type of model, um, you are assuming you're making certain assumptions. And if those assumptions are not, uh, you know, valid, then you may do all the math, right? You may have it theoretically correct, but it doesn't really mean a whole lot. Uh, and that seems to be a decent chance of uh, why this theoretic, um, you know, is not playing out in all in actual uh, real world applications. Uh, another reason is that possibly increased pay means workers have more money to spend. And this, according to, you know, Keynesian economics is allowing for these people to then have more money to spend, which then will stimulate demand because, you know, if you have more, if the workers have more money, then they are going to be able to spend that money. And then that's going to increase demand within the uh, local economy. And that's going to end up requiring hiring more workers, which if it doesn't necessarily increase the workers, it may at least offset the workers that may, you know, theoretically would be uh, unemployed because of an increase in minimum wage. And then also higher wages attract more applicants and decrease turnover. And that lowers costs for employers because hiring, um, you know, hiring costs are a pretty big chunk of what employers have to pay. And I can speak for myself. I know um, that when I was looking for jobs growing up that I was I, most of the jobs that I worked were loading trucks, uh, working on like changing tires at an automotive shop. Um loading hay bales on a farm, uh, doing things that were definitely harder than, um, you know, a lot of other jobs. However, I was picking those because they were above minimum wage. And because of that, I was much, I was staying at them longer because I knew that, you know, I was getting paid a better salary for what I was, or wage, not salary for uh, what I was doing. And, that's something that's really important to keep in mind because if anyone that's ever worked a minimum wage job, I think it's fair to say that most people that do, um, you know, if I work, uh, for, you know, seven twenty five at a supermarket and someone is, you know, shoplifting or something, eh, most of the time it's not worth my, uh, it's not worth my livelihood to try and stop someone for seven twenty five an hour. Um, and so I think that's something to keep in mind that, uh, you know, 
having higher wages and getting compensated the way that you're supposed to be gives people more pride in their work, generally speaking. At least that was the case for me. Um, and so, you know, this, generally speaking, increases morale and productivity with employees because why wouldn't it? <laughs> like, that's the whole point is you're incentivizing them to, uh, you know, work better by incentivizing them better. It's not complicated. And uh, there's basically... You know, when you look across meta studies, which are a collection of a bunch of different studies averaged out in order to get a more accurate representation than maybe some independent study done by a think tank that may have a specific bias, um, there has basically been no evidence um, of increased minimum wage causing employment loss and even showing the opposite in some states. There is a really interesting example of where... Um, New Jersey and Pennsylvania, which are neighboring states where New Jersey raised their minimum wage and uh, Pennsylvania did not. And the neighboring towns around it, uh, you know, there was, you know, the thought was that, oh, well, people will, uh, you know, there will be more unemployment in New Jersey and there will be increased employment in, you know, or the same rather in Pennsylvania. Um, but that was not the case. And there's a really good, uh, example of that i i know i watched uh M on mit's uh youtube page they have a really good um example of a professor going through that specific case but um yeah so that's the second one the third lie is that a minimum wage will just increase costs uh this is you know obviously for the business owner but they're suggesting that this will increase the cost of goods um for the consumer and this also has not been shown uh, in practice. And there are a couple reasons why. Um, number one is that labor isn't the only factor of producing goods and services. Uh, specifically, um, the best that I could find, at least uh, for an average in the United States, is that this usually makes up uh, the labor production costs, usually make up about 30% of overall cost of goods in the United States. So just because labor goes up doesn't mean that 100% of the cost is going to go up, only a 30% chunk of that cost is going to go up, the other 70%, you know, not necessarily. And then the other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, there are other effects that, you know, can offset the increase in labor costs, um, like what was previously mentioned. And actually, there's a really good study that's linked below uh, from 2016. And it's on California, because when California increased their minimum wage, um, they showed that, you know, a 25% increase in minimum wage only increased prices by 1.45%, which is pretty, pretty good. You know, if I'm, if I'm a working class person, I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, you know, and then on top of that, another thing to keep in mind is that, uh, you know, Keynesian economics would suggest that you, you know, increasing the cost of minimum wage even if it were to increase the costs of goods that still isn't necessarily a bad thing because it would still be you know helping the bottom you know the people lower in the like lower in the class structure um closer to minimum wage because the people that make minimum wage of course their pay will go up and then people that are close to minimum wage their pays will generally speaking be adjusted to go up also, that's pretty widespreadly shown. Um, those people now have more buying power, whereas someone who, like myself, who's an engineer, my pay from a minimum wage increase is probably not going to change much, if at all. Therefore, the person that is making minimum wage now has greater buying power relative to a person that is higher up the economic totem pole, therefore helping them with their you know, real, va the real value of the dollars that they're making. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. So even if that third one were true, that it would increase cost, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a bad thing. So important thing to keep in mind that, uh, often goes, you know, over our heads, I think. Um, now on top of those three, you know, lies, myths, whatever you want to call them, um, I think it's also important to understand, you know, what minimum wage is and how it's changed or hasn't changed over time. So 
I know something that is brought up uh, pretty consistently is minimum wage versus productivity. So I think it's important to understand that productivity, what that means is it's basically output over input. So you're looking at, um, you know, like a business has so much they put in and then they have, you know, output, whatever comes out. Um, over time, businesses in the United States have been getting more efficient. Therefore, we have higher productivity because it takes less input for more output. Um, and over time, you know, this is skyrocketing in the United States increasingly because of, you know, more automated systems that make production easier, not too, uh, you know, too complicated or abstract of a thought. However, um, you know, in theory, a capitalist economy, which the United States is, um, you know, it should reward workers that are the most like that are more productive, the more productive you are. Um, at producing, you know, value in society, the more you should be rewarded with, you know, more pay and therefore value in return. Um, however, this has not happened in the United States. Uh, when we're looking specifically at productivity and we want to look at since say, you know, 1979, and I'm going to pop that up so you guys can see with me. Yeah. So when we look since 1979 specifically, um, we can see that since then there has been a huge divergence between um, productivity and hourly compensation. This massive gap is that difference. Up until then, they generally kept pace with each other. Now, there are definitely arguments that um, you know this is not necessarily uh, you know it doesn't necessarily need to keep up uh, because. Productivity of the overall economy doesn't necessarily map or shouldn't necessarily map towards minimum wage because minimum wage is not the majority of the economy. However, uh, it's also important to keep in mind that when we're looking at this stuff, that it hasn't kept up with the real value either. So specifically, when you're looking at minimum wage, minimum wage in 19, so today is 725, right? Minimum wage at its peak in real value, meaning value adjusted for inflation, in 1968 would be worth $10.50 or so. So over time, we've seen almost a 30% drop in real value of minimum wage. So while even if we wanted to say it shouldn't necessarily keep up with productivity, we still have to acknowledge that since then we've gotten much more efficient our economy has grown a hundred percent yet wages at the bottom have gone down 30 percent that doesn't really sound like we're rewarding you know those workers and then when you keep in mind that you know the gains at the top of our economy this essentially means that those are failing to trickle down and benefit the average worker um, which has been a pretty big uh, talking point since 1979, which uh, 1980 was the beginning of the Reagan revolution as a specific example, which was kind of the beginning of trickle-down economics, at least colloquially. Um, and since then, specifically, we've seen it's not really happening for the average person at the bottom. Um, yeah, instead, what we're seeing is that we have you know corporate taxes that are historically low while profits, you know, and CEO pay, like relative to employees, continues to grow astronomically. Um, and this is why, in my opinion, it's really important that we have policies like minimum wage, because these companies, you know, have and will continue to take advantage, uh, since they literally have every incentive to do so. It makes them more money. That's what their goal is in, you know, a capitalist economy. That's why it's important to have regulations in order to protect workers, um, you know, from companies that are just doing what they were designed to do. Um, so based on that, when we're looking, that would mean historically looking at 1968, the peak of real value that just to keep pace, we would need to move the federal minimum wage up from 725 to at least $10 per hour. And, you know, if we're comparing it to the average wage growth, not the productivity gap, then we would want to see it at about eleven and a half dollars an hour, right? So, no matter what, 
it needs to move up some if our goal is to, you know, reward those in society for working hard. So here's that chart that I am speaking to. Um, so here we have the minimum wage. Here we have the average um, wages in the United States. And here we have the productivity. So as we can see, real wages dropped. Average wages have stayed about the same, right? Productivity continue to skyrocket. In my opinion, I think we need to have it at min at least minimum wage should be at that eleven thirty five mark because that's kind of the point. Otherwise, if it's not rewarding those workers, then doesn't seem like the uh, system's working too well, in my personal opinion. And then if it kept up with total economic growth, as you can see, it'd be all the way up here at almost nineteen dollars per hour. So even more than 15, which of course is the general, uh, you know, most thrown around term of fight for 15 that you see. So 15 is kind of conservative uh, compared to productivity when, you know, if we really want to be honest about it. Um, and so the takeaway for me is that, you know, minimum wage is not, first of all, a comprehensive solution to fight poverty. Um, not claiming that whatsoever. That's also a myth. But, um, you know, the evidence shows that you know, it's good for workers and it helps the economy and it's meant to be a living wage. All three of those things are undoubtedly true. Um, and it hasn't, like I said, it hasn't kept up with productivity, hasn't kept up with average wages. And essentially what this means is that workers are getting less for the same or more work, which in my opinion is a travesty when you compare, you know, the United States today versus 1979 or the 1960s. There is no reason with the technological advances that we have at this point um, and the increased automation that people should be getting less real value for their labor. And that's, you know, that's my opinion on that. Now we're going to get back to the chat and see what's going on. Awesome. Cool. You haven't finished. No, I have not finished my pistachios yet, Nikki. You gave me a ridiculously sized bag. For anyone that doesn't know, um, my girlfriend's family is uh, Persian and Persians eat more pistachios than anyone's ever seen. Um, and so she's very sweet and has uh, gives me these giant um, bags. And this is 40 ounces, which is uh, like two and a half pounds of pistachios. And I am almost done with them, but no. Not quite yet. I will. I will get cracking after this uh, video, or maybe I'll even uh, maybe I'll even crack them into here and make some pistachio ASMR for you guys. Um, Jashim, thank you. I appreciate it. I saw your uh, your um, what was it preview basically for the video you did with uh, Purpose Driven, and uh, it looks really good. Uh, yeah, anyone that is interested in seeing some good, really good cinematography, definitely check that out. Um, and Kev. Thank you. Appreciate you uh, checking in. Um, your live stream the other day was pretty lit. I definitely need to. Uh, I definitely need to get on that. And then, um, <laughs> yes, absolutely, Jashim, on the uh, pistachios part. Yes, she she makes sure that I. Uh, yeah, she makes sure I'm taken care of for sure. And then <laughs> I'll I'll have to do that as a uh, as a joke one <laughs> at some point. Um, and then, yeah, as far as uh, talking about the um, Jashim with the uh, saying uh, no minimum wage and companies will def take advantage of slave labor. Exactly. I mean, that's literally the example. Like, that's what slave labor was. <laughs> like, that's what you get when there's no when there's no labor protections for a specific class of people. Uh, slavery is literally what you get. Um, yeah. I, I saw a really bad video uh, on YouTube the other day of someone that was talking about this trying to suggest that um that like slavery was not a side effect of you know the economic incentives at the time and anyway you'll have to see it to to know but i will be i'll definitely be doing a react on that because it's it, it's it's too entertaining not to um and in just a moment i will get started on the next topic uh like i said before uh, I'm doing each of these topics set aside and in between I'll be checking the live chat and catching up with everyone. Um, and then once I get started, I'll be on that topic. Just be patient and I will get back to you in one second. I'll get started. The next topic is going to be on California prop 15 
and uh, how that you know will affect the average person. And yeah, Joshim, it's a really embarrassingly bad video. Like it's it's a guy who um, has been on Dimitri's podcast who does. Uh, I'm not going to say the name, but he's done in he does investing videos um, as well and has about 4,000 uh, subscribers. And uh, it's, I mean, most of his content I really like, but man, it'll be, it'll be an extra video during the week at some point. So you, you will definitely get that. But, and with that, three drinks. I got to stay, I, I like to have variety. I got yerba mate uh, tea for the caffeine. <laughs> yep. I got, um, uh, grape Hawaiian punch because I'm 10 and then I've got water because I got to, uh, keep it, keep it all, uh, you know, balanced out while <laughs> speaking. And Kev, at some point I'm definitely going to do one where I, uh, I'll definitely do one where it's like a happy hour style where I actually drink. Cause I know you want to see that. Um, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm a, I'm a thirsty, uh, thirsty man. All right. Dope. So with that, we are going to get started on the next topic. Okay, so the next topic is going to be on California Prop 15. So I think it's really important to understand the background of this. And again, this is, I'm in the state of California, but if you're not, this is definitely something that will, um, you know, likely end up affecting you uh, in your state because California generally, when they, when they make changes, other states tend to follow um, as far as worker and consumer protection rules are. So it's important to understand that since 1978, uh, with the passing of Prop 13, that made it so that properties in California uh, were taxed based on the purchase price. And then from that purchase price, they would be taxed annually just by adjusting it with a 2% uh, increase or inflation, whichever one of those is lower. So it's important to understand, and if you've ever looked at California property values, uh, you'll understand that they tend to increase faster than inflation. So this ends up causing a huge loophole in California tax laws, where basically an investment firm or a person even that has purchased a property, say, years ago, has a massive advantage um, when it comes to you know, the amount of they're paying in taxes. Uh, versus a new competitor to the market. So Prop 15 is a proposition to amend the state constitution and the tax uh, commercial and industrial properties um, on the current value instead of the purchase price and then use those funds for education and local government because you know that's where California needs a little bit more help is in the infrastructure because if you've driven on roads that are state funded, you'll see why. Um, they are really bumpy and not as well maintained as they should be <laughs> given the GDP in California. So when we're breaking this down, uh, you know, propositions come down between their yes or no votes. So a yes vote basically makes commercial and industrial properties except for commercial agriculture taxed based on their market value rather than their purchase price, which should increase tax revenue because it'll limit those that, you know, are paying very low taxes because they bought something decades ago. And a no vote would continue to tax commercial and industrial properties based on the property's purchase price with annual increases equal to the rate of inflation or 2%, whichever is lower. So how does this matter? Does this affect, who does this affect and how does it affect them? So this only applies to properties uh, that are commercial or industrial. So if you if it's residential property, this will not affect you whatsoever. Um, it only applies to properties that are worth over $3 million. So the idea is that this would carve out um, exceptions for smaller business owners uh, that have a you know much smaller business. And the idea is that this will begin rolling out in uh, fiscal year 22-23, and that small businesses will then even be given a further provision if they have less than 50 employees are independently owned and if those independent owners own California property 
then they will get an additional three years before they have to uh, comply with the um, this new restriction. And so they have until FY 2526. And the estimated uh, revenue that this should generate is going to be between 8 to $12 billion annually. And what they plan on doing is ensuring that they'll update this every you know three years or less. So the idea is that this will end up helping cut at the deficit that California has this year um, due to the, you know what's been going on. And who it'll benefit is schools. So it'll increase the funding for K through 12 public schools, community colleges, and local school boards. Uh, I've, it'll also end up providing some funding towards uh, you know charter schools, but the majority of it is going to be going to the public ones. Um, it should, in theory, help small businesses. Uh, however, we have to keep in mind that some small businesses do rent from these larger um, investment firms and that there could be some negative side effects to that that some people are concerned with. And I'll go over those in a moment. But, um, you know, it exempts small businesses as well from personal property tax and it gives them a $500,000 exemption, which is pretty helpful if you're a small business owner. Uh, And again, anyone with under $3 million in industrial or commercial property Land and property costs a lot in California, but that is going to cut out a lot of um, people on the lower end, which should at least help them in theory. Um, Because specifically, that is going, that specific stipulation will end up making it so that only 10% of businesses in California will end up making up about 90% of those taxes paid. So overall, this should be something that, you know, vastly uh, targets the bigger corporations in the state of California and helps out the smaller ones. That being said, the thing to keep in mind and the one positive possible uh, negative is that say an investment firm owns a strip mall or some other industrial uh, property and they rent out those, um, you know, spaces to smaller business owners. Those smaller business owners then could end up seeing that tax cost passed on to them. Uh, I haven't seen a specific measure to try and prevent this, i.e., you know, like some type of rent control measure or something along those lines in order to keep rent uh, landlords, commercial landlords from passing this uh, on. However, we'll see. That's the one thing that I'm a little bit uh, unsure of when I'm looking at this bill. Um, That being said, as I understand it currently, my opinion on it is that I think it's a good thing, and I plan on voting yes on it. Uh, So yes on 15 and no on 22 like earlier. Um, And the reason is because I think it does a good job of leveling the tax burden um, for these, you know, institutions that have been around a long time versus new competition. And what that should do is allow for more competition, um, which is generally speaking good for consumers and good for small business owners trying to get into the market. Um, which is increasingly difficult in the state of California because of the cost of land. And I like that it makes it more costly for investors to hoard. While I'm definitely someone on my channel that talks about investing for, you know, average people, I live in California and I can tell you that it's a really big problem here where you have houses that go on the market and then immediately have cash buyers that are from, you know, investment firms that are, looking to essentially, you know, gobble up these properties and then either, uh, you know, renovate them or rent them out. It's, uh, it's not good because it increases the cost of the property so much artificially. And that's why more so in the Bay area and San Francisco and such. Um, but in LA as well, that's why you have such a problem with, um, having empty homes when there are, you know, pretty big homeless issues, uh, in the state of California as well as any big city, but I'm talking about my anecdotal experience here. Uh, and also I think this, you know, will help fix the loophole and, uh, mostly paid by bigger businesses and a very small amount of them that have been skating for a while, which I think is good. And, uh, you know, what's to not like about being a Californian and seeing, uh, (laughs) seeing improvement in roads and social services and schools. 
because Rhodes is the one that I know the most because I don't have children yet and I haven't had to use social services in the state of California. But I know that um, that if you drive anywhere outside of, you know, like say, if you drive in LA County versus like an LA County road versus a LA city road, it is a big difference. And then even more so when you get to like state roads, they need all the help they can get. So I think that generally speaking, it should be good, but uh, definitely look into it yourself and check in the description box below where I have some good breakdowns uh, to try and simplify it for you. And now we're going to go back and check the uh, live chat and see what's been going on. Oh boy. <laughs> awesome. Okay. <laughs> Salud. Yes, Kevin. Yes. I didn't mean to mess you <laughs> whenever I did that the other day. Your uh, uh, Dia de los Muertos uh, shot glass just made me think of it. And I immediately was like, you know, that's what I went for. So. And yes, Nikki, always got to stay hydrated. It's amazing. Like, I know Dimitri does his podcast with, you know, at least, you know, like with another person. Uh, talking for an extended period of time um, where you're having to fill all of that. Um, void without having a lot of you know liquid man it, it'll it'll wear out your oh my yeah just shame i'm sorry yeah louis rossman i love that guy he's amazing um and yes i 100 percent agree with him that yeah good i want the property value like property values need to drop in those in areas that are overly gentrified um like santa monica and new york a hundred percent um sorry about that that was i got excited um and <laughs> thank you, Kev. I appreciate it. And yeah, Jashim's style is really good. Uh, I'm I, I I can do that. The uh, <laughs> drinking in a pistachio ASMR. <laughs> and thank you, Kev. I appreciate that. Hmm. A hundred percent. Yeah. Once Vince is done, um, someone said uh, Jashim said this is a good topic for life uh, with Vince Lou. Yeah, I want to talk with him. I'll reach out to him about it because I wanted to wait till he got a little bit settled into just starting as a real estate agent and um, get his opinion on it. Because, yeah, and then also he's up near the Bay Area, so he has much more uh, pronounced of these issues uh, than we do in Los Angeles. So thank you for that. I definitely will check that out. Um, and, yeah, investment, yeah, it, you know. People with people with a lot of money pulling it together and uh, not helping uh, not helping small small people that just want to live. And um, <laughs> yes, Nikki, I I will I will do. Um, maybe I'll maybe I'll end the stream today that way. That's probably the best way to go. So the people have spoken. I will eat pistachios at the end of the stream for your uh, pleasure. And then in just a moment, but yeah, anyone that hasn't uh, uh, Jashim in the chat. Louis Rossman, check him out. Really great guy. Like I love it. his topics are <clears throat> phenomenal. Like all the way around. He uh really like the type of content that I am looking to really make where it's uh focused on the average person and trying to uh, you know, make it <laughs> like in uh in the United States as is. And uh really good stuff. I might do a reaction to him. I'm not sure. I definitely I definitely want to Next week, I'll be my topics I've already picked are going to be on the housing issues in the United States and in the state of California. Um, so things like uh, eviction, rent control, stuff like that. And uh, probably I'll talk about gentrification as well, which I know Louie talks about. Um, but yeah, so be on the lookout for that. And then I'm going to get a sip, uh, another sip of something. Um, we're playing roulette over here, and then I will uh, get on to the next topic. <clears throat> awesome okay and so the next topic i'm going to be going over today is why the stock market is not the economy so it's a really common colloquialism for people to say the economy is great look at the stock market and this was definitely true in january before you know, it all fell down for a little while. And, um, you know, this is true for lay people and for some politicians, if it's in their interest to believe this. However, it's really important to keep in mind that the stock market is not the economy. 
because when we're investors, we need to have a nuanced view of what we're looking at. And, you know, recently we've really seen this be like come true. Uh, you know, we've had massive unemployment, increasing income inequality, and, uh, you know, without, without a rent slash, uh, you know, without a rent and eviction moratorium, we would have record evictions right now um, because of the economy shutdowns. Uh, and that's really important to keep in mind because despite this, the stock market is still doing relatively well. Uh, right now, at least today, we are only about 5% from all time highs, which is insane, uh, in my personal opinion, given the outlook, but we're going to look at the specific reasons why. So right now there are three main reasons that I think the stock market is as high as it is. Number one, and the primary reason is the fed. So the federal reserve is the banker of last resort. For anyone that's not familiar, I did a video on it uh, a couple weeks ago. Check it out. It's on uh, COVID, the stimulus, and uh, the Fed's um, reaction. So check that out if you want a more thorough breakdown. But basically, they control the interest rates in the United States, which affects the price with, that banks are able to borrow money at. And that, of course, trickles down to what we're able to borrow money for. And <clears throat> lower interest rates mean lower asset prices when you go to get a loan. And that makes people buy more, generally speaking. So they lowered interest rates almost to zero, and that increases the amount of people buying homes, even though there are going to be, of course, people that are getting less money right now, uh, which would suggest that you'd have less people buying. We've seen more people buying homes because they're able to get them with lower interest rates, which saves them a lot of money on something with that much uh, of a principal cost. And we also saw a ton of people refinancing their mortgages, which still helps stimulate the economy. So both of those have helped um, pump up asset prices, specifically in real estate. And then there's not really anywhere else to put money because right now we have historically low uh, bond yields, which bonds and stocks are usually the two areas that most investors, since real estate can be prohibitively expensive, um, look at. And generally speaking, when stocks do poorly, you want to be in bonds and when bonds you know, are normal and times are good, you want to be in stocks. And right now, bonds aren't yielding much. So most institutional investors are not going as heavy in bonds as they normally would. And that means that they're going to put more money into stocks and real estate, the other main asset classes uh, outside of commodities like gold, silver, etc. Um, and then you can't ignore Jerome Powell with his money printer and the uh, liquidity that that gives. And basically the Fed was using that one, it gets more money into the economy, which there's more money in the economy, then more people are spending money. If more people are spending money, then that's going to increase asset prices because there's more money going into those assets. Um, but also, that increased liquidity was also used to uh, buy underlying bonds by the Fed and even ETFs. And so that directly increases those prices, which helps prop up the market. Reason number two is that the people, you know, with money, like I said, they don't have anywhere else to put it, and they absolutely don't want to hold cash because right now, be, due to that printing of money, we're likely going to have higher than average inflation, and normally inflation eats away about 2% per year of any cash that you're holding. It could be, you know, it could be the same if QE works as well as it should, but most likely it will be higher. Um, and higher inflation, well, one, pushes up asset prices because it artificially inflates their um, their nominal value as opposed to their real value. And so that means it's more advantageous to be in those asset classes, whether that's real estate or stocks. And it doesn't make sense to hold cash because it means your cash is getting even smaller than it would normally. And reason number three is speculation. And this is definitely the smallest of the reasons because the reality is that lay people uh, are not the people moving the market. Generally speaking, it's investment firms um, and big buyers. It's not independent people, uh, retail investors. However, there's a lot of newbies in the market. Um, you know, with Robinhood, Webull, um, and other brokerages going to zero commissions and these app based um, brokerages, it become and what I would call gamification of investing where it seems very uh, easy and accessible to the average person makes a lot of people feel very confident in the market. And so they get started 
And then you see a lot of them start immediately jump towards, say, you know, using leverage or using like margins, which I talked about last week with uh, leveraged ETFs as an example. Um, or they want to place bets on very risky companies because they're not looking at valuations because they don't have the experience. Um, and that leads to the thing I also talked about last week, which is greater fools investing. And essentially, this is why you see things like when Tesla's doing well, which up until recently before its stock split was, you know, up above uh, $1,500 a share. Uh, that's prohibitively expensive for most people. And so if I'm a newbie with, say, three grand or even five grand, um, I probably am not going to want to spend all of that on two or three shares of Tesla. Um, but what I would maybe do instead is look at, oh, what other EVs are around and how can I get in on the action, so to speak? And I think this is why you saw a lot of like Neo, um, Workhorse, Hylion, you know, you saw these get pumped up like crazy just because Tesla did. And there wasn't much of a reason for that. And that's why you're seeing them come back down to earth, um, in my opinion. And that's something to keep in mind too, because that definitely is a big problem is seeing things like, and the most egregious was Hertz, uh, where Hertz files for bankruptcy and then their stock shoots up several hundred percent following that, which is absolutely insane and was clearly, you know, people that were uh, newbies and not looking at valuations of companies, um, which is basically gambling. So, um, yeah, so that that definitely is not helping. Um, it's important. That's why it's really important for investors to start off, uh, you know, very tempered in like understanding what is an expected return, like what's reasonable and what's not. And that way they don't get taken for a ride on some of these things. So now we understand those three things that I think are propping up the economy right now, um, or the market rather to make the economy look good. Now let's look at what is the relationship between the stock market and the economy. Cause right now I've only been talking about the stock market. Um, so the economy as a whole, right is not the stock market, but the stock market is essentially like a measure of the sentiment of investors around the future of the economy. So I think it's important to remember that investors only make up about 50%, uh, 55, I believe of the, um, you know, like only that many people. So not the entire, you know, uh, population of the United States. It's only about half of them that are even moving this. Um, and so, you know, inv if basically if investors think that a particular stock or asset class is going to do better in the future than its current price indicates, then they'll buy it. And when they buy it, this moves the price up and that shows the confidence in the future. You expand this across the rest of the market. And, you know, if people are doing this across like on a macro trend, then macro just meaning large scale, uh, then the market is going to go up because of increased buying. So that's why the stock market would go up. So if the stock market is up, uh, there are multiple possible reasons for this. And we just need to remember to approach these, you know, topics with a greater level of nuance. Um, so like I was saying, about 55% of Americans own stock. And so it, it's important to remember who's gaining, like when we're talking about the economy and the stock market, because again, 55% of people are gaining when the stock market goes up. The other 45 aren't really seeing anything directly from that. Um, they may have some, you know, small benefits, uh, you know, inherently that, uh, you know, are not increasing their actual net worth, but, um, directly only about 55% of Americans are seeing that. And most of the 55%, you know, this, these are in retirement plans. These are not active stock traders. So these are people generally speaking, just buying the S and P index. Um, they're not really placing bets, so to speak, you know, they're just trying to follow the main, you know, the biggest companies in the market and follow the market as a whole. So the people that are really moving the market, it's mostly those big investment firms. Um, and it's important to remember when we're looking at, okay, so why? So then what would be like, why is it that these people aren't investing, right? Like why is half the economy missing out and therefore unrepresented in the stock market? You know, 
you got to remember that in order to be able to invest <clears throat> responsibly, that's the important thing to keep in mind. In order to be able to invest responsibly, technically, you could take out a loan and invest it all on Bitcoin if you wanted to. But, um, you know, there are th at least three things that you have to do first. Okay. The first is to cover the cost of living, right? Housing, food, other necessities, right? Second is, and this is an opinion, is to uh, pay down high interest debt, um, you know, because uh, low interest debt, you can at least worry about a little bit later if it's, uh, you know, lower than about three or 4%, generally speaking, um, you're probably better off getting an emergency fund first, but that can go either way. It just depends on what type of, uh, you know, percentage you're getting. And I have uh, some links below to some good high interest savings accounts. So be sure to check those out. Um, but my opinion, I would pay high interest debt down first, but that's just me. And, but some people will put it th this, these two reversed. But my third would be save a three to six month emergency fund. And this is because look at right now, if you were someone in March that had a job that uh, went away or you like a lot of people in the airline industry got furloughed at the beginning of this month, you're definitely going to want to have three to six months of those costs of living set aside because that way you don't have to get high interest short term debt in order to make it buy. And then once you've done those three things, then you can start investing. Because up until then, in my opinion, you probably shouldn't. It's not a very safe thing to do um, because it, it could bite you pretty hard. Um, and so it's important to remember that for many Americans, like they can't achieve these goals. Um, or if they can't, then that means that the market does little to help them. And that's the primary disconnect between conflating the market with the economy. And that's why when you know, especially when politicians do it, it's very disingenuous. So the main takeaway here is that for you as an individual is to make sure that you, you save so you can invest and that way you actually benefit from the market increases because yeah, there's, if you can, you need to be, uh, there's no reason not to. And then you need to remember that investing requires, you know, a nuanced view of the economy, both micro and macro. So individual stocks and the economy you know, overall. And also I think it's really important to call people out when they spread these types of myths, uh, similar to the minimum wage ones. We need to keep, you know, people grounded in reality and make sure that we are holding, especially politicians accountable, but, um, ourselves and, you know, anyone that's talking about this stuff, myself included. So let me know if I'm full of it. Uh, but yeah, that's this topic. Cool. So now I'm going to go back to the uh, live chat before the last topic of today, which is going to be on Roth IRAs. And let's see. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely, Jashim. It's, um, Jashim said it's crazy to think about how many people uh, would have been homeless, uh, I'm assuming because of, uh, you know, the moratoriums, like if that hadn't been around. Um yeah, absolutely. Like, it's crazy to think about. And it's amazing. Like, people don't think about um, how close they are to being, like, you know, it's very common. And don't get me wrong. Like, I'm not, um, you know, I'm definitely part of this. Um, it's, you know, to think of ourselves, like, to see someone, you know, like Elon Musk as an example. and Or Mark Cuban. Uh, and think, oh, you know, I... I could be there because of the, you know, American dream because of, you know, access to investing or to just knowledge or whatever. Um, it's easy for us to see aspirational things like that uh, and see, oh, man, I could be there. But I think people don't realize uh, when you look at it statistically, you're far more likely to end up being homeless, um, you know, or a refugee from another country than you are um, to be a billionaire or, you know, it, it, it's, it's an important thing to remember. And, uh, that's why it's really, yeah, I can't wait to go over that topic next week. Um, for sure, because it's, it's really sad, uh, to see honestly, but, um, yeah. Okay, cool. So I'm going to get ready, uh, to go over this last topic, which is going to be on Roth IRAs. And then I will, uh, then the pistachios will come. So I will break those out at the end. I do not want to, uh, I do not want to get pistachio shell though, um, and you know particles beforehand. I will definitely uh, need way more water during that segment. Otherwise, so in a moment I will get started on the last one. And if you're just joining me, 
um, uh, in between topics, I will check the live chat. So if you have a question, comment, whatever, uh, feel free to put that there and I will get to you as soon as I get a chance. Please be patient with me. Thank you. Awesome. So our last topic of the day is on why everyone needs a Roth IRA. So first of all, if you're completely uh, unaware, a an IRA stands for Individual Retirement Account. And uh, it's similar to a 401k, um, but unlike a 401k, it doesn't require a W-2 employer to open. Um, so anyone can do it. And if you're not in the United States, um, you know, W-2 employer is just a normal salaried employer, uh, salaried or hourly employer. Um, and so currently you can contribute to a Roth IRA regardless of age, uh, after 18 and you can start withdrawal at, um, 59 and a half and you can continue doing that whenever, uh, which is a really cool thing. And uh, if you're younger than 18, you can even have your parent or guardian generally, uh, you know, open a custodial IRA in your name. And that's a pretty awesome thing to do. And if you're in a position, if you're someone who's just starting out about to have, you know, has young kids or has a family member that has young kids, this is something that if they have the means to, they absolutely should, uh, have links below explaining how to do that. So definitely getting started earlier is better. And if I had it to do over again, I definitely would take any birthday money I had as a kid and put that in there. Um, cause it, it pays a lot out in the end. And, uh, so a traditional IRA is done with pre-tax income. So what this does is this makes the initial principal, so the initial amount put in more, but it's then taxed upon withdrawal. So you have more taxes taken out at the end. Um, so that's what a normal IRA is. Whereas a Roth IRA is a special tax advantaged account where you put post-tax money uh, in, and then that way, whenever you pull it out, you don't pay any taxes on the gains. So in theory... Uh, you know, the average person, this seems unimportant, uh, but let's assume that when you are younger, right, that you are making less and therefore you're taxed in a lower tax bracket. Um, so in this situation, you know, it's important because that's the majority of people, uh, to prioritize a Roth in my personal opinion, because that way, when you're, you're putting it in, like say, you know, you're making uh, let me look at the tax bracket real quick. If you're making like, say, mm -hmm, yeah. So if you're making like, say 50 K a year right now, right. Then you're getting taxed at around 22%. Whereas if you're making, um, you know, over a hundred K you're getting taxed at closer to like 30%. So that's a pretty big difference. Um, Eh, long term. So in my opinion, I personally like to prioritize Roth simply just for the tax reasons. Now, even more so though, uh, you're probably trying to save up like me for a house if you're a young person or some other big purchase. And that's where a Roth IRA really, you know, really sets itself apart. Because with a traditional IRA, since it's not taxed up front, that means that if you withdraw anything, you end up having to pay taxes on it. And you'll end up having to pay a 10% tax penalty as well. That sucks. You don't want to do that. Um, whereas with a Roth IRA, you're able to withdraw any contributions that you put in, i.e. what you put in, any principal, but you can't take any of the gains out without paying a penalty. But you can take any contributions you put in out early, which is a huge benefit and a no-brainer because that way you have the flexibility, which is kind of like what a savings account has, but with the upside that a retirement account has. So kind of the best of both worlds. While ideally I don't plan on pulling money out of my Roth IRA, having that as an option is a pretty big thing. Because one thing that's pretty daunting for a lot of people with traditional IRAs and 401ks is if I save too much, then I might not have enough uh, if I end up getting in a bind and I don't want to withdraw and pay that penalty, that's why I think a Roth IRA is definitely a, um, you know, a pretty good place to start and no brainer. <laughs> and so keep in mind, a Roth IRA is just a type of account though. Uh, this is not a specific investment. 
you pick the investments inside of that account. This is just a account that is tax advantaged. That's all it is. And once opening, once you've opened that account, you pick investments just like you would a normal brokerage account, Robinhood account, whatever. Um, and personally, I choose to stick mostly with index funds. A good example of an ETF for that, since that's available in any brokerage account, is a VU, V O O. Um, but that's up to you. You'll have to do your own research. But you know, as an example, if you owe, if you're someone that doesn't want to go through opening up a traditional brokerage account, and you open up one with say like uh, I don't think Robinhood does it right now, but if you open up say Webull, which I have a link for below, um, and it's a pretty easy app that's on your phone, so a lot of people like it for that reason. Um, you have access to ETFs like VU, and that's a good good place to start if you're someone that's just getting, uh, you know, your journey begin. Um, and you know, it's important to get started as early as possible, and it's uh, you know a great way to get started with an IRA is as an example, just putting your tax return in there. So even if you can't save money any other way, if you're able to at least, you know, keep your budget in line throughout the year, then presumably your tax return is going to be, quote unquote, extra money for you. And on average, a tax return in the United States is about $3,000. And $3,000 is about half of the contribution maximum that, uh, you know, you can put in an IRA per year if you're under the age, I think, seven, uh, 70 or 65 and um so that's a good way to get started and then you can you know work to have a little bit of extra room in your budget to add a little bit more gradually each year and i want to show you as an example like here's a here's a calculator this is on nerd wallet and the uh link is in description and let's say you put in just that 3000 per year just to give you an idea of how big of a deal this is so if you put in say 3000 per year and let's say your age Let's say you're age 30, ballpark. Um, so, cool, you're age 30. And then let's say you're going to retire at 60, just so we have super easy math here. And that means 30 years. And let's go with 8% because that's about average and single. Cool. Awesome. Now, when we look here, <clears throat> yeah. So what we're looking at is, uh, that's pretty insane. Um, why is that? Oh, good. Just making sure. Yeah, cool. That's insane. That's with only 3,000. You're looking at 1.3 million. That's an insane gain, especially when you consider that 3,000, I am, when you're looking here, you have 3,000 and times 30, simple math, 90,000. That math's definitely wrong. Hold up. Yeah, that's looking at, um, that's definitely looking at uh, something else. Yeah, so we're saying, okay, cool, dope. 3,000, years to grow, 30, cool. Interest rate, we're looking at, yeah, 8%, cool. And perfect, and then future value, calculate. Okay, cool, that makes more sense. I was about to say, that made no sense. Yeah, so you're looking at only putting in 90,000, you're looking at over, you know, $350,000 by the time you retire that's tax free. That's a pretty great start. And you definitely need to look at what your goals are for retirement, but um that's a pretty great place to start. And then obviously, if you double that, you know, if you're able to get up to the maximum, you're looking at you know 734,000, so 3 quarters of the way to a million dollars just with a Roth IRA. And that's starting pretty late at 30 because a lot of people have, you know, things like student loans that they want to pay off beforehand or other types of debts. Um, so even if you're getting started late, even if you are retiring at 60 as opposed to 65, so even earlier, it's going to put you way ahead of your peers. And that's why it's really important to, uh, you know, open and contribute. And also, you need to keep in mind that this exists because the government wants to incentivize investing. Um, it's a really good deal. So you should take advantage of it because it's subsidized so that you will. And, uh, you know, like I said, if you're able to save extra money and you have a taxable income under 122000 per year, 
and you haven't started, definitely sign up for one because there's really no reason not to. And when I say taxable income of under 122K, that means that say you, you know, have, let's say you even make up to 140,000 and the 401k limit per year is, you know, 18.5. Well, you have, if you're maxing out your 401k at 18.5, then you should still be under 122,000 taxable income because that'll lower your taxable income by $18,500. So if you're making, you know, anything above 140, then probably not. But under that, you should be maxing this out if you have the option. And yeah, definitely get a Roth IRA and check in the uh, links below because I have some good resources. That way you can uh, double check my work. Awesome. That is the last topic for today. Uh, yeah, that calculator, I got to check. That was, that was messing me up. I was like, what? That's, that's not math. Okay. Now let's go back here. Let's check the chat and get to these pistachios. Okay. So yes, absolutely. Nikki. And, uh, yes. Thank you, Jashim. I really appreciate that. Have a great dinner and, uh, yeah. Hope you enjoy the last one. And yes, thank you, Nikki. Yeah. Yeah. That first calculator, I was like, holy what? That's not right. Um, <laughs> I was like, what is going on there? Um, yeah, that was that had some assumptions I was not aware of. So uh, we got that fixed, though. But yeah, it really does put it in perspective. People don't realize, you know, three thousand dollars is not. I mean, that's a lot. Don't get me wrong for the average person, but when you look at it from the perspective of that's what you get in your tax return, um, you know, it makes it a lot more tangible. Uh, and then when you keep in mind that you know that's less than like, you know, that's less than ten dollars per day, even if you were trying to save it. Um, you know, a lot of people will be able to, uh, meet, that's a goal that's achievable for a lot of people, which is really important because when we have goals that aren't achievable, we end up falling off the wagon often. And, uh, we definitely don't want to do that, especially when it uh, has to do with our livelihood. So let's get to these pistachios and, uh, let's see. And if you have any other questions or comments or anything, uh, put those in the live chat in these last couple minutes, and I will get to those. So, here we go. Oh, yeah. You hear that crack, dude? Yeah. These are really good, by the way. If anyone doesn't eat pistachios regularly, you really should change that. They are phenomenal. This isn't as good as Kevin, um, because Kev on his live stream... Kev ate a whole pizza the other night. Um, so that was pretty cool. I was a little bit jealous. But yeah. And if you guys have topics you want me to cover uh, in between, like on other future episodes, try and let me know, and uh, I'll definitely try and get to those, um, assuming that I have the knowledge base to cover them. And if I don't, I will read into it. And as far as like future stuff... Um, Generally speaking, I want to try and do this where it's like I have some deeper to deeper topics and then some simpler topics at the end. Um, that way it's more of a cool down for people and mentally. And then uh, I'll do some more videos in the week, um, throughout the weeks. One of the clips from podcasts as I have been doing, but I'll do some more of like I mentioned earlier about that uh, video, um, you know, pointing out some reactions and then also... Um, you know, and then also do some other like fun stuff, like, you know, maybe just some fun live streams of, uh, just playing games or something like that. Uh, so if you guys have ideas, let me know. Um, and yes, Nikki. So for anyone that doesn't know, um, so Nikki said, I want to see you eat a whole rotisserie chicken, the next live stream. So I do want to say there is a really, what I want to do long-term, one of the many things I want to do long-term is I want to do, um, I want to do a thing where I'm going to start, I want to start doing some interviews with people. Um, especially anyone, if you're someone that's been affected, um, as, as a small business owner, uh, or, you know, employee, um, if you've been affected heavily by COVID, I'd like to know about it, like economically and get your perspective, your perspective, especially if it's in a couple different States. So I have, a you know, some ideas and perspectives from the average people, um, and on that note of uh, interviews, I want to, at some point, 
uh, whenever I'm able to do like interviews in person, I want to do uh, something like some like hot one style, like where it's speed round of answering like different financial or stuff, questions like that. Um, I think that'd be pretty funny. Uh, and maybe you could do that through Zoom or something, but not as not as entertaining. And then, um, yeah, so the story that Nikki's time out. So when I was in college, I loaded trucks at UPS for like five years. And um, yeah, it, it's a really, uh, it's a really um, hard physical job. And uh, yeah, I would literally eat like 5,000 calories a day and not gain weight. And my first night that I went to uh, UPS, I was living in a, you know, like a dorm and I had just moved and I didn't have any, um, utensils or anything to eat with. So instead I went, cause I'm cheap. I went to Walmart and I bought a half gallon of milk and a rotisserie chicken, which cost around $8 total. And I ate an entire rotisserie chicken and drank an entire half gallon of milk with my bare hands because I was extremely hungry and did not have any utensils. So that is what she is referring to. Um, and it's amazing that she still dates me, but I appreciate her for that. And with that guys, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate you guys coming and, uh, yeah, this has been fun. And, uh, next week, uh, I will have, you know, it'll actually be on Sunday again and we'll have, hopefully we'll have too much of a busy weekend and uh, yeah, thank you guys for tuning in. Really appreciate you. And I will see you guys next time.